is my student at the University of Texas, so he has heard a lot of my thoughts over the years, and he's going to get to hear a few of them again. Um, I should say also, for those of you uh, out there in the audience, please feel free to ask questions. We've got plenty of time. There's only two clarinet students this year, so that leaves us lots of time to get through everything. So I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions as we go. Please just, you know, yell it out or stick your hand up. I'm happy to do that. So, um, great, Ren. This is really nice. You know, um, really most of the elements of what you're looking for in this that, you know, you already know, I would probably tell you about, are there. There's just a few little details. Um, one of the, just right at the beginning, I think it's, most of what I would point out is really making sure that no matter what you're doing with the dynamics, that you're getting the Dolce care, right? So, the, a big one at the beginning is, um, sorry, I know. Yeah. <laughs> a big one is the E, um, so this is the end of a, for those of you following along, this is the end of a long crescendo that we have a tendency never to do enough of, that then is, is followed by a subito piano. But the problem is, is E on our instrument, E's and D's, tend to be a little bit on the bright side. They hop out really easily. And it's right in the perfect part of the crescendo that it's going to pop out. So if you can make it not pop out, uh, Here. 
And the thing is, for us, it's the same notes both times, but the harmony changes underneath, major and then minor, right? So um, what a lot of people will do is they'll play louder and then softer. Um, and so what I've always found actually makes more sense, it accomplishes the same thing, it's actually easier, is the first one we actually go to the D a little bit more, we crescendo, and the second one we decrescendo, you get the effect of something that's a little bit softer. So it's the same thing, it's a, it's a way of showing, I mean there's two, there's two benefits to this. One is when we're playing the music, it makes sense, we're sort of changing our color. Even though we're playing the same notes, we're changing our color to match the harmonic um, uh, structure. If you're playing it by yourself and you're playing for an audition, which of course is what we spend a lot of our time preparing for, um, it shows that you understand what's going on. So, yes, you're correct, you just put the marks in there. I'll, I'll, maybe I told you the wrong thing at some point, but I don't think so. Um, so, and then the, the advantage of that is the third one which functions very differently, which actually has a crescendo marked. The first one, the third one can contrast more. If you've done a day crescendo, da 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 dee, da 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 dee, da 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 dum, that leads into the what? What's, who's playing after you there? The, the horn. The horn. It's only, it's only two options in this, in this trio, right? So you've got a 50-50 chance. Yeah. <laughs> it's not you playing. It's either cellos or it's a horn. Yeah. So, um, and that one can lead more. I always think of it that way. I think of completing the, the melodic content. So the first two become just little answers. The third one becomes the melody. Yes. Okay. So let's start right there for a second. trying to be careful, especially with the autism stuff, let that sort of, let that naturally just get a little bit louder, right? So we spend a lot of our time trying to compensate for the fact that the clarinet wants to do certain things that we don't want it to do. So it's going to want to get louder as we play in, into the autism. This is a perfect opportunity to just let it do what it, wants, what it wants to do naturally. You don't have to fight it quite so much. Now the second one has a different story. Right? But, but try that. Now, I should say, 
I have now seen, I have more recently seen an edition of this symphony, I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but where there's a date shown over there. And that's actually the way it's printed. So I still, I still play this way until I'm told otherwise. Um, but there actually is a version now that I've seen of that. And in many ways, that makes more sense. Da da da. Right. But for now, we play it this way. Pushing, we keep 
keep stretching that as much as we can so we can really hear that contrast. But that's much better, okay? So again, it's just, it's sort of, this text are more than many of the ones we, we play. There are other ones like this, but we, there's so much sort of jumping around in subido dynamics. Like on the surface, like the dynamics feel so kind of weird, the subito pianos, they feel so awkward. So you have to you have to get so comfortable with that those extremes and the way you're placing those dynamics that it sounds actually very dolce and natural and fits in with like the you know horns and the, um, and the cello joint. The other thing with this excerpt, by the way, is when you play it actually in the orchestra, you play it. Out. I mean, um, this is often the case with these sort of excerpts when we're playing it by ourselves versus when we're playing it with the orchestra. But really, with all the cellos wailing away and the horns playing, we can actually play out. We just have to make sure that our dynamic contrast goes up accordingly, right? Um, okay, so um, the last thing here is actually the next section was great, and all the same sort of things that we've talked about with dynamics apply there, and I thought you did a really nice job. The, one of the biggest things with this one is just the ending, right? How to, like, do we take time? Do we not take time? What is your current? Um, idea with the end. Oh, uh, to take just enough time that it sounds intentional. Just enough time it sounds intentional. Okay. Can you play that? Yeah. Like from But be really careful that your second 
I don't know if this would have come across out there, but that there's second B. Da 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 da. Yum bum bump is well supported. Yeah. I hear a crap in the sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got to be careful if we do that sort of air release. Da 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 da. Yum bum bum. Yes. That we don't go bum bum bum. If we do that, there's no way to say it. Yes. Yes. So don't ever do it. All right, great. Let's go on. Has got any Beethoven eight questions? All you clarinetists out there.
contrast, but it, it's it's not present enough. Sure. And and keep in mind, it's not marked. This is not a place where it's marked forte, gamma, forte, piano. It's just marked forte, forte, forte. So maybe we're splitting hairs a little bit, but I think you can do a little, have a little bit more sound. I like to think of it as like again, I'm I'm a little fatter on the first bar, yep. and it's still loud, but a little bit less less so in the second bar. Those are the only things. Your decrescendo was was great. You might have just rushed the last bar. Yes. Um, not that you ever rush. <laughs> um, just just see if you can. It's really just those two things. But just see if you can do that one more time. Gave up on it on the last note. No. Beam, bum, bum, bum. Okay. Yeah. So this is tough because we need to phrase. We want to phrase. We don't want to go. All right. There's nothing musical about that. So we have to do it in a way that we leave enough room to phrase, like you did. You just did too much of it. All right. So I like to think of it slightly. If I if I go beam, bum, 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 bum. So I lead to the second bar. And that gives you a little bit more room to feel natural, bum, 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 which of course is very appropriate for Beethoven. So if you just think a little more direction, bum, 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 now we have more.
nice playing it here by yourself, isn't it? You get a little bit of like this, you get a little bit of like reverb and it sort of helps everything kind of ring really nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is very good. I think, you know, uh, there's, there's two or three little, little tiny things. Uh, you know, you've heard this from a thousand people, and anybody that plays a clarinet has heard this from a thousand people, but I think you need a little bit more um, length and espressivo on that eighth note down. Okay? Okay. So, and I think it's, this is a really, this is a hard, hard thing to sort of figure out exactly what we need there. Is it just longer? Is it heavier? Is it more espressivo? But I, I think the danger is that we go and we sort of do that, lean and completely come away. We still need to hear. We need to hear that connection. So we need to hear. Right? There's just an extra note that needs to be attached to that. So. Again, you know this, but one of the things I think we can do is simplify all of these things when we're practicing so we know what we would do if there were less notes. It was a more simple line. If we went, if we took out the G, we wouldn't go. Oh, 
about the bead popping out. Just yeah. ignore that. But um, <laughs> you know, so it's just we just follow the contour. I like that better. I like the phrasing ones. I like it better. And then it has the bonus. It's easy. Yeah. Sure. And there's a phrasing choice that you happen to like better that makes makes the instrument easier. This is like bonus time. So um, now I'm not saying switch it, but I think yours is the harder way to, to show some some dynamics there. Um, it's harder to be convincing. So you've got to you've got to be a little bit more. To me, it sounded basically flat. Okay. So I think you can do a little bit more of that. Um, really make sure that it, this intensity all the way to the F and then come away from it. Um, I know I said there was only one other thing, but there's two other things. And that is just be careful when you do the sutra piano. So the, the natural tendency there sometimes is going to be to play those, to try and make sure we don't get too pecky. But I think you went too far the other end. And in here, now in a different room that might have been fine. But in here, we still need that, that Beethoven balance in yes. over and, and then the last thing is just on the last trill. This is another place where we can, you know, going back to this idea of sort of showing what else is going on. I think if you, you know, you know this, but bum 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 da 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 This is what we can show place. If we kind of do a little crescendo, day crescendo, um, it, it helps hear that, but that's what the orchestra's doing. Mm -hmm. I think if it's just,
feels more natural. You sound like you feel more comfortable and natural sort of shaping those couple of bars that way. So all good. You just have to be aware of the things. One thing I think that you have to be super aware of when you go to the F, dee da 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 dee da da now you're thinking coming away. And we've got this, we've got these brace notes. Da 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 right. So you've got to make sure that you practice um, You've got to feel that. You've got to feel that line. Yeah. And that's what we as clarinet players don't do very well, right? As we're decrescendoing, we have a tendency to not score very well. So it's so easy to get. That, uh, yeah. yeah. So, again, take out some notes. You know, if we just simplify that so we can feel physically what we're doing and feel just a big picture of the, dyna of the dynamics, phrasing dynamics, I would call it at this point, I think it becomes easier then to add all the other stuff back in. But yeah, don't let me change those. Don't change it if you like it that way. Um, and the rest is great. I think just even the trill at the end, just being sort of aware of thinking about the, the orchestra underneath it, sort of changes, it just changes what you do. You add a little color, you add a little dynamic contrast and, and it's a big difference from just <laughs> okay all right good I think um, yeah, yeah. Next time. 
time you have it, first of all, it's, it's notated differently. But I think it, the, the intensity is building at that time. So. You know, there's more room to do something a little bit differently. A little quicker, a little louder perhaps. So I feel a little bit like when you take time, you always take a lot of time. Then you take a, there's a big pause. And then you play the next section, you take a lot of time, there's a big pause. And I think you can think about like, where do you want there to be a big dramatic silence? Where do you want there to be not, a, you know, what's gonna make it more dramatic? What places are gonna be more dramatic by not having that silence and vice versa? I mean, usually the, the trouble we have is we're afraid of silence when we're playing. We, we tend to struggle with just having a gap. Uh, you're doing that great. You're creating, you know, you're creating that intensity, I think. Um, I think in general, the whole thing can feel uh, longer in the phrases. So, um, Sound, but like in the back of the hall, or is it like 
maybe a more diffuse, a diffuse, we, we tend to have bad connotation. We don't think of that as a good thing. But, but I, this is all in, in the realm of a, a, a good sound, well supported sound. But do, does it, should it be maybe a more diffuse sound that is kind of, I don't know, slightly vague? Yeah, I. Augmented? Closer, closer to that, I think, but still like solid. Yeah, we, I mean, you know, we certainly always have to have like some, a, a core to the sound. But I think within that we've got some room, like if I want to think um, really focused. Or maybe I want to think a little more vague. think colors, you know, we talk about color, and people think like actual colors, and that works. I tend to think, I don't know, images, um, and that works for me. You know, it could be a story, um, you know, it can be programmatic if you want. I mean, that happens to work well with opera, but um, I think it can be anything, but I think you can play around with that a little bit more. Because again, now we've got, now when we get to the second time we do that, Yeah, 
I 100% agree with that. And I think do the first part of what you say. Go go to the A and make and still make those intents. So. Um, Let's jump back forwards. No, I tell you what, just do it from the beginning and keep going. 
But this time, let's, let's, we're sort of focusing on what I was talking about before. Let's make this a much bigger variety. Should 
if it's an opera, we should know the whole thing. And I, you know, we should know the whole story. We should know everything about it. I mean, generally speaking, someone dies, right? So, um, <laughs> but not always, not always. Usually the big clarinet moments seem to involve someone dying. But, um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very it's, good it's point. Very poignant. What's that? Very poignant. Part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And now for something completely different. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, on that end, how difficult would it be for the clarinet to begin with the first note, like very gazing, like you're saying about image, something very soft, the first note, and then, okay, yeah, yeah. Instead of, oh, here is the clarinet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, we can, sir, we'll go backwards for a second. Um, I mean, I think. I think the, the point with this is that, that that is probably one of the moments when, in, in a lot of the repertoire, out of all of the repertoire we play, where we can do that. There's nothing going on. So we have that ability, you know. Or whatever, you know. Yeah, um, thanks. <laughs> you know, so, and it probably depends. I mean, it depends on the hall. If I'm down in a, if I'm down in a crummy pit and, and, my, and I can't, milk it quite like that, or maybe I'm in a place where or whatever, I, mean, I probably wouldn't do that, but, but, the, but the point is, is absolutely valid too, yeah. Um, and we can, exactly, we do. As long as we've got a sound that can project to be heard. I mean, my goal is always with my sound is to be as, how much projection can I have in my sound? So that I can play as soft as humanly possible, and I can still be heard at the back of the hall. So that's another way of looking at it, and that kind of applies to this particular moment, because if I can do that, then I can really, for lack of a better word, milk it. <laughs> but, yeah. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So, again, now for something completely different. Say what I'm going to do, and then I'll do it. And then you take 
like you take two more little ones. Mm -hmm. So. And then play. Um, it's sometimes that's the difference. It, this, you've got to be really cognizant of like not getting super super tense. But it's amazing when we take. You know, we're let me back up for a second. We talk a lot about making sure. Wind players talk a lot, as I did, about not getting up, not getting tense up here. But if we breathe correctly, naturally and relaxed, then you know we should expand here, out, and then up, and the chest should expand a bit. But then you can actually, you can squeeze a little bit more in. And that can be really helpful for this. And I think what you'll find actually, if you practice that a little bit, you won't need to breathe that way always. But it kind of gets you feeling like, what is a really full breath? Yeah, that is something that I like. I feel like I'm like, okay, I need to take a really big breath, but then it never feels totally like it was the biggest one. Yeah. So just try it. Try it once. I mean, again, it, it sort of gets counter to some of the other things we're talking about. Because when you squeeze that last little bit in, it does not, you don't feel relaxed. Okay. Um, Um, can you just play, um, 
Can you just play the eighth notes? So. Feeling is 
isn't it? Yeah. It's like, oh yes, honey, I mean, that's what I have. I'm not gonna no, it's not gonna happen. No, <laughs> um, but you know, one of the things, I mean the last thing I'll say, because I think I think we're almost out of time, but um, you know, I do believe also that like the more we practice feeling like we are squeezing every last drop of air out, the more efficient we get, the more we get used to um, being efficient and using that air that way. And I do believe, I mean, we cannot increase, unless we're still growing, we cannot increase our lung capacity. This is not possible. But we can increase the efficiency by which we use our air. Um, and so, you know, if we're, if, I mean, this is not a, this is really not a topic to start talking about at the end of a master class. But, um, you know, if you can really be aware of, um, for me, I the word compression, the way we compress our air and how we, how we do that efficiently, and we push ourselves to the limit, we start to learn how to be more efficient with that. And ever so gradually, we can do what feels like increasing our lung capacity, which is not increasing the lung capacity, it's just being more efficient. So, um, you know, I think my long tones are set up, for example, to be that way, to make sure that we're sort of pushing ourselves to the absolute limit. Um, so we're essentially working out those muscles. I mean, this is perfect excerpt to make sure that, that you're doing that. So do exactly what you did, which is that it's that moment where you feel like you're out of air and there's nothing left, but there actually is. Mm -hmm. if, if you've ever done, I'll never forget, I'll leave it with this, but I don't, I'm sure these are all digital now. But when I was a kid, um, I was at a music festival and somebody had a lung capacity, a, a, lung, a machine for measuring lung capacity. And it's basically a machine, it, you know, they used to be like, it was like a needle with a little pen in it. This, and it was just a hose that you blew into that seemed like it had no resistance whatsoever. So you blow into it as fast as you can, and then you have to keep blowing until it, they, sort of, they say done. And there's no resistance, so you feel like all your air just goes whoosh, and then you're just standing there going. And, but it keeps going. If you, you watch the machine, it's amazing, actually. You, you have more... You have more in there than you think, and you can actually you can actually get better at pushing, you know, pushing a little bit more and controlling it. If you ever have an opportunity to do that, I'm sure it's all digital now, but um, it's it's an interesting it's just an interesting thing. See, it's also interesting to see what your lung capacity is, you know. Um, but anyway, that's that feeling of that, you know, where there's you feel like there's absolutely no air left and you're just pushing nothing, but but you were you were pushing something. So um, good. I think you know, I think if you can practice this, I know it doing this one a little quicker, but if you can just practice um, the way you're thinking about the phrasing, especially the eighth note. I, and I actually think that you know, one of the things we have to spend a lot of time working on in this is the, is the 16th notes and them being uneven. If you think more about yep, da, 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 actually that, that grouping will help the instead of which will, I think, naturally tend to be more uneven. So I think that will have, we haven't even talked about making it more even, and I think just being more aware of the groupings, the way you want to phrase that, will actually help the 16s. And then good old just practicing the, the, yeah, the 16s will, will help. But I think that's, that's a whole lot better already. Um, so, great, okay. Um, um, I can't believe I, we ran out of time too. Um, yes? Yeah, so we practice this, this Shostakovich up here at Round Top for 440 feet. Next week, you're going to perform in space and ask me. Uh -huh. Like, I, I practice music here at 440 feet when I go to Bishop, California, at 400 yeah. feet. And then occasionally play in Mammoth, California, at 8500 feet. Mm -hmm. So you, you've developed a strategy for breathing and playing this correctly. Sure. But then, but then you, have, you have a problem of going up to. I don't know, 6,000 feet. Yeah. 7,000 feet. And so, sure, surely, you then have to adjust. modify your strategy. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of things. First of all, I would do everything I possibly could to avoid, like, going and immediately playing Shostakovich 9 at 7,000 feet. Yeah. But, um, I mean, your, your point is well taken. Um, first of all, I mean, you certainly have to play on softer reads at altitude, you know, and, and you kind of get, you start to get the hang of that, and that will help a little bit. It, in something like this, if I literally can't, uh, make that adjustment, um, I may have to cheat and take out a note with something like that. I mean, that's the extreme version. Um, I mean, a perfect example is a couple years ago I played, um, I was playing Mozart clarinet concerto, and I played it several times that summer, and the last place I played it was in, um, up in the mountains in Montana. 
And, and I had just switched to playing on you know, basset clarinet, which is the long, you know, the long clarinet, and it's much more resistant. And all of a sudden, there were places in that, in that um, concerto that my students would breathe, and I'm like, you cannot breathe there. No, absolutely not. Not there, not, no, no, no. And then I went up to Montana, and I took every single one of those breaths. So, um, you know, it's, some of it is just getting used to, you know, what it feels like in the resistance of the instrument. Um, some of it is playing, probably playing on slightly softer reeds. And then some of it, when all, when all else fails, you've got to cheat. Yeah. And breaths. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's, that's rough. That's, I mean, for anybody who hasn't played at altitude, you know, it's for a wind, wind instrument, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's a big But you said you said playing softer reeds is quite hard. Yeah, typically. I mean, typically, my regular strength won't, I mean, it just won't vibrate at altitude. I need to play something a little bit soft. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks to Brendan and Evan, and thanks for coming, everybody.